Hello and welcome to In the Envelope, an awards interview podcast. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, the most trusted name in casting. I'm here to spotlight some of the most exciting film, television, and theater awards contenders working today. Who is in the running? What makes an awards-worthy performance? And what, dear listeners, are the secrets to giving one? We're sitting down for intimate, inspirational interviews with actors and artists to get that insider's perspective on these questions and more. It's an opportunity for some of today's most talented stars to share their craft and career advice, and maybe, just maybe, provide a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. I'm not really about the whole, like, you're one thing and that's what you're supposed to be. Sure. Only, totally. like, <laughs> mentality, you know? Totally. Um, <laughs> I always want to be doing several things at once and, like, exploring different parts of myself, my creativity, you know? Totally. that it yeah we're starting happy new year <laughs> happy, new happy new year, year. happy new year um and to the listeners how was your year so far yeah how's this your year one so far <laughs> <laughs> yeah i like that we're, we're what seven days in yeah. a week in yeah it's been good it's, it's been, been a, good i think so far yeah it's been a nice gradual start what about you i think it's been good it's a nice new energy almost yeah 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 um yes to listeners Maybe you're joining us for the first time because you're a fan of today's guest, Amanda Stenberg, mm-hmm. or you're a regular, loyal listener. Either way, welcome. Welcome. Welcome to another, we'll call it another season. I don't know. I Why always not? just call them new seasons. Yeah. It's a new year, and we're starting with some uh, Oscar contenders with these episodes that are coming out this week. Mm. It's Oscar season. Yeah. The Golden Globes were just this past Sunday. Yeah. Last night. <laughs> Um, yeah, last night for us. And uh, friends of the podcast, Darren Chris and Regina King both yeah. won, which was fun. And a lot of familiar faces on Ton- stage yes. in the crowd. Uh, yes, and a lot of kind of repeats of um, Emmy wins or maybe even predictions of next year's Emmys. And then, as always with Golden Globes, there's that thing of like, is this going to predict the Oscars? Um, yeah. And we won't know. I mean, nominations won't come out until the 24th, I believe. Can I just put on the record 22nd, Olivia Coleman? I believe. Can I just put yeah, that on the put record? Her on, oh, we can put her on the <laughs> record. <laughs> yeah, she's. You know how I never see I never see a movie twice, and I have seen the favorite twice. Oh, really? Yeah, I loved it. Oh, oh yeah. my god. Um, but today's guest is Amanda Stanberg, yeah. which uh, from another movie that I absolutely love this year called The Hate You Give. Mm. Um, and I do want to kind of like prep the the interview a little bit because for those who don't know. The Hate You Give is based on the very successful young adult novel by Angie Thomas. Um, and it's about Star Carter, who is this high school girl. She kind of lives, but she's black and she's from a black, she lives in her black neighborhood, but she goes to a majority white school. Um, Amanda and I definitely kind of got into it with this with this interview and all of the amazing artists involved. Yeah. Um, but also the other thing I was supposed to mention was that at in the envelope is on Twitter. Yeah, we've been saying this for a while now, but I want to put it before interviews in our banter as well, mm-hmm. because 2019 is our year on Twitter. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> we're going to take the internet by storm. There we go. That's the <laughs> New Year's resolution I want to hear. Um, at in the envelope is, on, is available on Twitter. Uh, down the line, we are going to increase our social media presence. We have mm-hmm. big plans for that. But yeah, if you're a loyal listener um, and you haven't given us a rating or hit the subscribe button or left us a review on iTunes, Um, feel free to do so. Feel free to tell all your friends about In the Envelope. Yeah, and we're on Spotify now as well. That's right, we're we're on Spotify, yes. Um, Amazing. And then also, we're going to tease our next episode Mm. at the end of this one, which I don't believe is something we've done before. No. If we can throw this together. Oh, I've done it. Oh, you've done it. I've done it, so it's happening. Oh, amazing. Okay, so I think we should not say who that is okay. until the very end of the episode. So listeners, after this amazing interview with Amandala, we're going to do a quick credits, but then we are going to serve a quick snippet of next week's guest. I 
think all I'm going to say is that she has an Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> And if you are a follower on social media, you probably <laughs> you know who know. it is. <laughs> there we go. Uh, there we go. She's gonna, yeah, she's our first um, Oscar-winning guest on the show. But in the meantime, Amanda Stenberg, who is at age 20, taking over the world. Crazy. I'm so yeah. glad that we were able to talk to her early at this stage and her taking over the world. Um, as you'll hear, she's wise beyond her years, does not even begin to cover it. Oh, and yeah. She's such an amazing activist, and she's representing all of these different underrepresented communities. And um, we got into it on The Hate You Give, which I think was a good kind of lens mm -hmm. through which to see the many issues that are on her mind. Yeah. And how much prep had to go into her creating this character and how much kind of hard work and agony, but also joy, joy and trauma and grief and anger. And The Hate You Give is largely about the Black Lives Matter movement and I think it's one of the most important movies of the year, frankly. Yeah, definitely. I agree. So um, let's do it. Let's get to it. This podcast is brought to you by Backstage, the world's number one casting platform. Listen, a lot of the guests on In the Envelope, an awards podcast, used Backstage at the beginning of their careers. It's how they are now in the running for Emmy, for Oscar, for Tony, etc. If you are at the beginning of your career as an artist, Here's what you do. You go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope at checkout for a free 30-day trial. That's right. Free 30-day trial if you go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope. All you got to do then is make a profile, upload a headshot, and start applying to jobs to the thousands of casting notices that are uploaded every day, which you can filter online to match your specific talents, your specific needs, your specific looks. Get that dream started today. Check out that free 30-day trial, backstage.com slash subscribe, enter the code envelope. Let's do it. Amandala Stenberg plays the lead role of Star Carter in 20th Century Fox's The Hate You Give, the big screen adaptation of Angie Thomas's young adult novel from director George Tillman Jr. and screenwriter Audrey Wells. Amandala got her start in the biz early, playing Rue in The Hunger Games, as well as working as a model, musician, and eventually even comic book co-writer. Also at only 20 years old, she's been hailed as the voice of an activist generation. Here it is, our chat with the brilliant Amandala Stenberg. Welcome Thank to In the Envelope. You. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> I'm it's great. so good to talk to you. I just saw the film, so I'm I'm in a great mind place to talk yeah. about it because I it's, it's really it's fresh. Fresh on your mind. Yeah. How are you feeling after watching it? How am I feeling about yeah, it um I thought it was just amazing. And I actually just tweeted a bunch of thoughts about it. I kind of think it might be the best <laughs> superhero movie I've ever seen. Wow. Like in the sense that... You're actually that, not the first person to say that. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Someone else said that it was like a contemporary superhero movie. Totally. Yeah. She's. This is her origin story. She's discovering her yeah. superpowers. And that was so, so powerful to right. me. It really unlocked something, this movie, mm. I think. Mm. Um, and I thought the whole ensemble was just, the acting was just so amazing. Yeah, everyone was just so incredible. Yeah. So many skilled artists who showed up just oh, yeah. from the authenticity of their hearts, like, to do their best work. It was yeah. just such an amazing environment totally. to be in, you know. Um, out of all of those artists, were you, um, I might need you to, like, say the story of how you got involved because you, sure, um, yeah. Angie Thomas, did she write the role with you in mind? And you got the manuscript? Yes. Or she wrote um, the part in the book, I should say, the novel. Yeah, so so Angie um who Andrew, is Angie was who is, who is beautiful uh, inside and out totally. and just wicked with words, both yeah. on the page and in person. Uh -huh. Um just hits you with those zingers mm -hmm. <laughs> and is just so real and I feel very lucky to have her as like a big sister to me mm. now, but um, which is ironic because my actual big sister's mm -hmm. big, uh, her name is Angela. So, oh, yeah. Cute. Um, but anyways, um, yeah. So Angie wrote the book, not with me in mind in mm -hmm. terms of like my own personal life story or experience. Um, but with a thought, oh, 
if this were to be turned into a movie, oh, wow. I feel like it would be someone like her,、mm-hmm. um, which I actually didn't learn about until months after we had finished production and、oh. we were heading into press, and like it was a story that she shared,、uh, okay. uh, which deeply moved me because、mm. there was definitely a lot of synchronicity when it when it came to how this project formed.、Um, yeah, and I was struck by that synchronicity when I first read the manuscript、mm-hmm. because. There were so many strange parallels between my life and the characters that were very direct and very specific.、Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, there's a lot of themes that a lot of people can relate to in terms of code switching,、yep. identity, navigating identity politics,、mm-hmm. um, police brutality,、uh, being black in America,、mm-hmm. and the ways in which we make ourselves smaller or the ways in which、mm-hmm. we. Have to undo our own internalized notions about ourselves in order to get to a place of、mm. healing and、hmm. and、uh, speaking up and out and being proud.、Um, so there's just so much good stuff in it. But I actually read an early copy of the book、um, mm-hmm. because my mom, who is an icon and knows these things somehow, heard that there、wow. was a lot of buzz about this manuscript within. The world of young adult fiction, right?、Um, cool. And so she actually got her hands on it and passed it along to me. Okay, for the purpose of getting it to you, to because she knew that it was up your alley. She knew, yeah, she knew it was up my、yeah. alley, and she knew that I would relate to it.、Mm-hmm. Um, and she knew that it could potentially be really amazing material for a film. Oh yeah.、Um, and right when I read it.、Um, UTA acquired the book,、mm-hmm. and then Fox optioned it to turn it into a film,、um, and we chased it. And they were so early in the、oh, packaging、cool. process; they were like, "Okay, you're, you're into like, this, I guess, yeah. Like, <laughs> you、sure. know all about it, it yeah. yeah." And you're a working actress, and、right. like, you know, I, I was like starting to tackle my first like leading roles and stuff. Yeah, and, and so、um, hmm. I attached, and and it all worked out with. Like I said, synchronicity. But I actually、mm. had to. It was like a year later. We had gone through the whole process of script writing and everything,、mm-hmm. and、um, I actually had to audition for the role. Oh, <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. So you're attached, but then there's still an audition involved. There was an audition. Yeah. So I attached early on. We went through the process of script、mm. writing, and then the book came out. And as soon as the book came out.、Mm. It skyrocketed to、mm-hmm. number one and、uh, was on the New York Times bestseller list for I don't know I think it still is on there it's like ninety、yeah. weeks strong totally and became wildly popular and kind of a phenomenon so there was somewhat of an additional pressure、sure. on the adaptation、mm-hmm. um, yeah. and I think the studio got a little nervous also、oh. because there had been some controversy around my casting. And so,、okay. then so、Which、they wanted to ensure. Yeah, we can get into that. Yeah.、Um, so they wanted to ensure that I was the right person for the job.、Mm-hmm. So it was strange because I'd already had it in my heart for like a year. Right.、Um, Which I think was helpful in terms of、yeah. approaching the audition,、um, but I had to go <laughs> in, and you know I worked with George, who we、mm-hmm. already had a relationship and everything.、Okay. George, the director, and、uh, went through the material together, and thank God they were happy. They were still on board. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. is strange to be yeah in it and then maybe not in it. That moment of like yeah, maybe this isn't happening. Well, you never know until like、yeah. a movie is actually out and in theaters、ah. that you are in it and it is coming out. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's really you true. You never really like get too comfortable. Yes.、Um, in fact, you guys had reshoots that cast a different actor in a role.、So、exactly. That right there is proof that. Yeah. It's not never... until the moment you're sitting in that seat. Yeah. Eating your popcorn and、yeah. you actually finish the film that you can be comfortable. Then okay, we did this. Right, totally. <laughs>、yeah. um, well, as backstage because we're backstage, we love hearing about like the auditions. So like,、yeah. was it a huge grueling process? Were you really emotional? Was it? I mean, it sounds、yeah. like you were relaxed with George. Like you kind of had a rapport with him. Yeah, well, George and I had already been kind of in collaboration with each other for about a year.、Mm-hmm. Um, We had been talking on the phone. We've been having meetings.、Uh, we went into meetings with Audrey Wells, who has since passed away, but、yes. our amazing screenwriter.、I'm、so、um, sorry to hear it. Yeah,、yes. yeah. She was just so phenomenal and so receptive. Like, really wanted to hear my perspective as she approached 
screenwriting because hmm. she knew that she didn't have the perspective of a black girl. Yeah. And so she... And it's a high school perspective, too, yeah, that you need. Yeah. Yeah. And I was able to reference some very personal details of my life mm-hmm. to tell her what something might have felt like just mm. because there were all these parallels. Right. Um, Do you want to yeah. get into the parallels of, like, what like what are the actual similarities? What? Um, um, so Star is growing up in a black neighborhood and attending mm. a white college prep mm. school across town. Um, I mean, you know, I say white and, you know, predominantly yeah. Caucasian. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's kind of navigating having white friends and being in a relationship with a white person mm-hmm. and having that whole world there, but then going back home uh, and switching back to maybe her most comfortable self. Mm-hmm. Um, one that she can't bring to school, Mm. Um, but then also kind of having to navigate being somewhat, you know, rejected from her community at times. Yeah, Um, from either, from both From both, yeah, Yeah. from both communities, yeah. And that's something I could relate to a lot just because I grew up in Mm. South L.A. and I went to a school with primarily white kids Mm -hmm. who were very privileged and... There was always a, such a separation, I felt like, between mm. my experiences and theirs. Um, sure. And so I, I often felt alienated in that environment just because, like, I literally was one of the only people who looked like me. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. And there were certain biases that those kids had about what my neighborhood was like. Sure. You know? So it was always like... Because they can't and, understand. You know, unless I, they were my really close friends, no one was going to come over to my house or, uh-huh. you know, anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And that's explored with such detail and accuracy in the book. Oh, yeah. Um, but it's also an experience that a lot of people can relate to, the experience of totally. code switching and and presenting yourself differently in different spaces, yeah. you know. I think everyone can relate to the idea of having multiple identities or, like, kind of presenting a version of yourself that's not the most authentic version. Yes, of Even course. Even if code switching itself, I think for some audience members, they don't necessarily know what that is. And I think this movie teaches them. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah, like we all do it in some ways. I think mm-hmm. I think maybe just the difference with code switching as a black person in America mm-hmm. or, or code switching upon that, la- that, that racial line, mm-hmm. is it, can sometimes imply uh, more of a danger. It's more of a survival Mm -hmm. tool for your literal survival. Existence. (laughs) And existence, yeah. Yeah. And the same applies to, you know, the LGBTQIA community, you know. Oh, yeah. Those who are institutionally targeted and and have their safety compromised constantly just because of who they are. Mm -hmm. So much of this movie, I could, I just kept thinking, like, all she wants to do is just be a 16-year-old girl. Like, yeah. it's, it kind of seemed like, correct me if I'm wrong, like, her mission was just to be herself and get through and, like, yeah. survive, like, survive the day-to-day of being a, it's tough to be any 16-year-old girl, but, like, and then this system just screwed with yeah. all of that. <laughs> yeah, and it's tricky because it's, like, then she's given this huge responsibility yeah. of, like, now she has to speak for her community mm-hmm. and speak for those who can't because they have fallen at the hands of racism, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And that's like another kind of catch-22. It's like not only do you have to avoid mm. pitfalls of navigating a white-dominated world, but yeah. but you also have the responsibility of now carrying the torch. And yeah. The spotlight and falls on you. speaking out, you know, and, yeah. and, like, being a voice for your community. And she really doesn't want to do that no. for a while. Yeah, you and, know? and you can't blame her for that. Yeah, because yeah. it's a, a huge amount of responsibility. It's, like, a lot of vulnerability. Um, and she just wants to live her life. Totally. <laughs> but, um, totally. you know, she comes to a place, and like you were saying, this is a superhero narrative yeah. Where, yeah. where she realizes what her strength and her power is yeah. and realizes that there's no point in running away from it. Yeah, that just becomes intolerable to keep running away from it, yeah. to remain kind of neutral. Yeah. yeah. Well, sometimes I'm like, damn, I wish, like, black kids could just live. 
Absol- absolutely. <laughs> or like, I yeah, wish yeah. gay kids could just live totally. or trans kids could just live. And I feel I like would, that's you know? the victory in mind. Like, that's what we need to get right. to. Yeah. It just kind of... Just exists. Sometimes it bothers me that, yeah, it, it becomes our inherent responsibility to be martyrs or, yeah, you know, or responsible leaders, or, leaders yeah. of our communities. Totally. Um, or only be postulated as that. Yes. You know? And in fact, that's very true for... Um, people in your position of in the entertainment business specifically, yeah. like you've become, whether you like it or not, <laughs> the face of <laughs> like young activist, mm. black, LGBTQIA, yeah. all of these labels that have to, I mean, we're all obsessed with labels, but especially We love labels Hollywood. right now. Yeah, right now. <laughs> What's that yeah, about? Totally. We and love it kind of seems them. like your generation's like fighting against that. Your generation, yeah. I mean. Well, it's kind of like I feel like we have to go through this really intense process of self-identification in order to get to the place where mm-hmm. we don't have to use labels. Yeah. I get it. Is It's like, well, if you've been historically silenced mm-hmm. and not allowed to claim those labels, it makes sense that yeah. now is like, you know, one of the times where it's something we get behind is like self-identification and like what it means to identify as something. Yeah. But it's sometimes like if it can feel a little... I don't know, limiting or oh sure, or just kind of detrimental in some ways. It can can make you feel a little trapped. Yeah, well, and without giving away the ending of this movie, like there's a there's a line that kind of indicates at the end that Star has found a way to reconcile yeah. the parts of her. Yeah, and it seems like that's what you're talking about. Like that's where we want to get to a place where you can just be as honestly yourself as as possible. Yes. That's the goal. <laughs> That's the goal, despite the many, yeah. many forces that are working against that. Yeah. I can't believe how many of those forces were detailed and examined in this movie <laughs> with such nuance. Like, even yeah. the little things like interracial relationships that was also tackled or, like, yes. <laughs> um, mourning and grief, yeah. trauma, trauma, which I want to ask you about, too. Yeah. Because as an actress, you really had to dig into that. Yeah. In your, in, in, in your body. Yeah. Yeah, it was a it was a really intense shoot for my body. Mm. Um, yeah, because I didn't, you know, I I felt so passionately uh, about the topics and mm-hmm. and the themes that were being explored and related to them <laughs> sure. a lot a lot of the time. A lot of skin in the game. Um, yeah, a lot of skin in the game. But like at one point, I realized that I had been like physically hyping my body up mm. so much with so much anger that like oh. I had really bad back problems mm-hmm. you know and stuff like oh, that yeah. um I I really did a lot of manipulating my own nervous system which is something you have to be really careful about sure. um hmm. and in retrospect I sometimes wish that I had taken some more time to more carefully put uh like protective Mm. measures in place Mm -hmm. you know um Mm. because i think you know even coming off of that shoot i had a really hard time like leaving those feelings behind me totally because the thing is i couldn't really you know (laughs) yeah it's in you because it's 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 in it's in me but also because it's in the world you know yeah and so it wasn't like okay like this is fictitious let's move on Mm -hmm. it was like all of that anger that I had always felt, but I I kept revving myself up over and over again, you know, like getting ready for a scene. I would Mm -hmm. do 10 jumping jacks, then pace around, Mm -hmm. and then do 15 push-ups and, like, get my nervous system so riled up and upset, you know, (laughs) just so that I could, like, do the scene from an authentic place. Um, And, you know, there's, there's different ways of approaching it. There are some actors that are, like, why would you need to do that? <laughs> mm, yeah, You're an actor. It's your job to act, to uh-huh. pretend. Um, hmm. I think I felt for this particular project like it was kind of my duty hmm. to operate from as much of an authentic place as I could. Yeah, to, like up know? the stakes of your own yeah. Your own self, yeah. And I think also I'm like a learning actor, so... Absolutely, yeah. And the, <laughs> and the idea of having to... Um, practice self-care but also to like wind down after that crazy scene like that is a skill that you just have to it sounds like you learn that in this process yeah exactly yeah definitely something that i've i've gathered now that i'm 
going to take with me and continue working on, like realizing I can get to that place, but yeah. what are the ways in which I protect myself beforehand mm-hmm. so that I don't end up with kind of like all this emotional fragmentation and totally. anger that I have to like then deconstruct after, you know? Absolutely. I don't yeah. know how you guys do it. It's like <laughs> about like setting up boundaries. That, yeah. But like you said, if you have a character like Star where you see a lot of yourself in the character yeah. and you're giving her such full body, like literally in your body, it's amazing to me that you say that you called it anger. That mm. that's that would that was that the chief emotion. Yeah. Throughout the process. Well, what did I, I read something recently that said, um, anger is just grief that has been sitting for too long, mm. and I've I've felt like that was what I was expressing a yeah. lot of the time is. You know, I mean, you grow up black in America (laughs) as a woman, as a gay person, like angry, you know, Mm. that you that you are constantly having to deny who you are Mm -hmm. or pretend that you aren't those things in order to. I don't know, make other people happy, make other people sure. like you, mm-hmm. um, be successful, yeah. get through it, whatever yeah. it might be. But like you carry that with you so often that you kind of just learn how to deal with it and maybe don't deal with it. Maybe your way right. of dealing with it is by not dealing with it, yeah. you know? Push it down. and Yeah, you push it down and you move forward. And hmm. I felt like um, working on this project for me was like, a really intense release. Mm. Um, mm. And it was a really intense, uh, like the anger that I was expressing was grief that I had had um, yeah. for maybe some of my own experiences or ways I had treated myself or made myself mm. smaller. Um, mm-hmm. Grief for my community, for what we experience, for the, for the violence that we face. Uh, grief from some of my family members and the things that they've been through, mm. um, you know, just grieving um, the loss of a certain levity and and joy that we just it's it feels like sometimes inherently can't have. Sure, you know, before it's before it even has existed, it's like mm. we're grieving it, mm. you know, and like God, I felt like. I had put, been pushing down all of that grief for a really long time, and then when it just came out as when I had to be angry. I, yeah. I was angry, but it was also it was like, you know, disrupting like this well that I had been yeah. covering and pushing down for yeah. a very long time. But you knew you had to tap into it. Yeah, and you did. You tapped into it consciously, but it's like it's it's emotion. It. it it controls you. you know? Yeah, like you don't necessarily, you're right. You, can, don't, you can't yeah. tap into it and be like, I want this much you anger now. You don't want to be like a freaking psychopath. <laughs> like, right. get to the point <laughs> where like, you're, yeah, you're like controlling like what percentages of sadness right. and grief you're experiencing. And that's overthinking it too. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why the tricky thing, the fascinating thing for me is the, is the after. Like after you've filmed an intense scene and maybe you've, maybe that scene is over. Like were there scenes where you're like, that one's done. And now I gotta unwind, and I don't know how to do that, and like it's still in me. Yeah, I would play uh, basketball with Lamar Johnson, who played Seven, yeah. my older brother, in it oh, a seven. lot. Like oh my God. you know, I loved Seven uh, so much. Oh my God, Lamar's the best. Oh. He's amazing. Um, such a fantastic human, like mm-hmm. such a great person. Yeah. Um, and you know, like he really was <clears throat> my big brother. I have a really intense frog in my throat. <laughs> <You're fine. laughs> I'm choking up because it just makes Cause me so more, happy yeah. <laughs> to think about. Um, he really was my big brother during the process of filming. You know, I would sometimes feel like in a really dark place and yeah. call him and be like, yo, are you up? And mm. he'd be like, what's up? What you need? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? And we would like walk to like the nearest basketball court and just like play horse That's you know yeah. <laughs> and like even just being outside and bonding in that way totally. like knowing I had that community was amazing mm. I also had such incredible support from Russell Hornsby mm-hmm. 
um, and Regina Hall. Oh my gosh. Just Regina Hall plays your mom. People. Oh my gosh. And, right? <laughs> like oh a dream gosh. come true. <laughs> she's so amazing. Yeah, she's incredible. Yeah, and I always wondered how Regina, because Regina is not a mom, mm. but she is so mm-hmm. believable as a mom. Mm. And I guess like a lot mm. of people have those sorts of maternal instincts, but yeah. like that's so wild to me that. You know, you like. I feel like when you watch a film, you're like, "That's a mama." Totally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> With her, yeah. Yeah. Oh, she she takes my breath away. Yeah. It, it sounds like. I mean, it sounds like the the sense of community is an important element in the act of like self care and of winding down yeah, and for sure dealing with the trauma and huge part of it. Yeah. And just like, yeah, being being in a space of like family, like mm-hmm. uh, I feel like it was a. Janet Mock said something recently about family or your chosen family Mm. being the ones that you have no fear of being yourself with, Mm. the ones that you can show all the way up and all the way out with and have no fear of being too much or too little. Um, And we definitely had that that sense on set. Yeah. MJ Rodriguez was just here and she was talking about that too. Mm. I, I think in reference to Janet Mock too, of mm-hmm. like the idea of a chosen family. And I think you're right. It's like anyone that you can be fearless with, mm-hmm. fearlessly yourself, mm-hmm. not just like assertively yourself or like <laughs> it's someone you don't worry about, I don't know, how they think of you. Yeah. Or judging you. Yeah. No, because you know you're loved. Yeah. And you know you love them. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it's. It's it's so like deeply healing. I feel like for your soul when you mm-hmm. feel that way. Yeah, you know? and I I saw that in the movie. Like I feel like one of the missions of this movie is to depict those just lovely feelings of in this case like a family family mm-hmm. of of total joy. Mm-hmm. And I mean, wh- what is the? Can I ask like what is the goal of the movie? Like in the context of twenty eighteen. What is it trying to accomplish? I think it's accomplished it, whatever it is. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Um, I think, I think there are several goals. Um, Oh yeah. I also think that the goal is different depending on who's watching it, you know, and like Mm -hmm. what they might need from it. Mm. Um, I think the goal was overall to, in times that are really chaotic and oversaturated um, Mm. to ground some of the events that we have seen construed in the news or in media actually placed into a human narrative. Yeah, cool. And into like a real narrative so that we are actually thinking of these things as not just things that are happening, not as just intellectual debates, Mm. not as identity politics, not as right and wrong, but... Mm -hmm. As like what it actually or, is, or statistics, yeah. yeah. But what it actually is, which is human and painful and nuanced and mm. messy and beautiful um, mm. and and open and you know it. The experience of being black is it doesn't exist in like a void and it's not something right. that is singular and can be yeah. debated. You know, yeah, it's it's cool. like a really large and nuanced and beautiful experience and it's different for everyone and so like especially in times when we're thinking about police brutality and we're thinking about white institutions it's like some of those conversations can get so heady and so Mm. kind of disconnected from feeling and so I guess at the end of the day Mm. the the goal was to make people feel something Um, yeah whether that was empathy uh, for Mm -hmm. an experience that they don't understand or don't relate to or or you know maybe need some need to be challenged a little bit (laughs) sure um or whether it was uh making someone feel validated and represented uh and less alienated alone Hmm. um and helping them you know because we're talking about therapy helping them through the film, maybe have a, a, a place to actually let go for a second and hmm. process some of those feelings of what it feels like to go through those things. Hmm. And maybe hmm. 
move through them a bit yeah. because it's like, you know, we we feel like we always have to push past um, the yes. things that are persecuting us or, or just push past the things that are bad, yeah. you know? that are hard to deal with. But you can't move... You can't move through them mm. if you don't let them exist first, you know? Yeah. And I feel like particularly in, in the black community, we don't always have the time to do that. And so right. yeah. the goal was that, you know, a black girl could go into this movie and see herself and feel feel like she was real, mm. like her experiences mattered. Yes. Um, and hopefully release and let go of some of that trauma. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah. <laughs> I think it is, like, it's almost about the act of watching somebody else do it. Like, the act of watching somebody else release trauma or to go through trauma, that mm. helps you do it, right? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so, yeah. Yeah, I think so, yeah, because then you realize, oh, we all do that, or we all need to do that. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, and and grief in particular, I think about how how it's so not one thing it it totally changes and it's so it's super nuanced mm. and there's often joy involved and there's often anger involved if the grief mm. becomes anger mm -hmm. um i think about that funeral scene in the movie mm. that was all of that it was mm -hmm. all of it alternately between all of these different feelings yeah and convincingly so because that's just how that's how it goes yeah Whew. <laughs> Woo child. <laughs> I know. Well, and it also we're, we're making it sound like this movie is like, oh, like so. Oh. But yeah. it, I think one it's of the most fun. important things about it is that it's super fun, yeah. and it ends on this note that I just found so. I needed it to end on a nice, on a, on a helpful note for Star. Yeah. And I think that that's actually so crucial to that message that we yeah. there's hope. I think there's a lot of hope in yeah. it. Yeah. Well, there's so much hope in Angie's book, mm -hmm. and Angie is is such a, like an optimist and and has so much love in her heart and like mm. i felt like when i read the book it was just dripping with like love and yeah. hope and strength yeah um, and so yeah that, that that needed to be in the movie too um you know even uh star's little brother's name sakani yeah you know <laughs> for joy joy and that's oh, yeah. something that is kind of referenced at the end um it's mm -hmm. just black joy and totally I think there's a few moments sprinkled throughout where I think George, as the filmmaker, was like, all right, it's getting heavy. You need some oh, black cool. joy. <laughs> Here oh, you go. Cool. Okay. You know, and like there's totally. there's some really like some of my favorite, uh, like when I was reading the script, I was like, these are some of my favorite comedic scenes that mm -hmm. I've, I've ever read also, you know. Totally. Like, yeah, it's about the multiplicity of, of uh, experience. Totally. What did you, um, is there like a thing that you're going to take from this film in terms of something you learned from these amazing artists that you work with? Like I'm thinking of George or of Regina Hall or of Russell Hornsby or Common played your uncle. Yeah. Like that's so cool. <laughs> like is there something that you're going to take into the next role maybe? Um, Even if it's like a very practical tip because like we love the little ins and outs of how you do things on set. <laughs> Ooh. Well, like what I learned from specific f actors or just like... Sure, yeah. Oh, my God, so much. Um, something <laughs> that um, Russell just... Well, okay, Russell is like a trained stage actor. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like earlier when we had a QA and a today, he recited like an entire passage from The Wiz, you know? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and, yeah. and like it perfectly backed up his point and it was beautiful and like <laughs> resounding and just amazing and so it is hard for me to settle upon one thing mm -hmm. to share that Russell has shared with me um, but something that he said to me once is sometimes you got to keep your fist but you have to put it in your pocket Ooh. Mm -hmm. and that's something that I find being really valuable to me because I, I think Sometimes I can approach the world or my industry or mm. whatever it may be with my fist first, you yeah. know? And, and that can be detrimental more so to me than to anyone else. Mm. Um, you know, if I'm operating from this place of 
of of anger or of resistance all the time. Mm. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And I think what what he means when he says put it in your pocket, it's it's not about letting go of that or right. discrediting that or you know like trying to invalidate that, but about keeping it in your pocket as a tool and as mm. like a gift, mm. um, and maybe keeping it hidden so that you can do what you got to do. Yeah. Um, and I'm currently not keeping my fist in my pocket because I'm exposing yeah. this <laughs> secret gift I've been given. Totally. I've asked you to take the fist out of the pocket. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, <laughs> but <laughs> it's one of my favorite things that sure. Russell ever shared. He also said, always make your own tea. Oh. On set. See, I like this. That's cute. That's good. It's That's good. It's actually important. Yeah. Always make your own tea. Don't have other people making it. Uh-huh. It's also, you know, learn everyone's name mm-hmm. on set. Great. Um, totally. Man, Regina just just taught me how to laugh. <laughs> oh, cool! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Regina just taught me how to like move through things with laughter. Mm. Um, is this like between takes or like after? Yeah, a heavy between. Scene? T- well, Regina is just hilarious yeah. at all times. Like she can't <laughs> help it. But yeah, definitely. You know, between takes and everything, she was mm. always goofing around and making all of us laugh. And it, like we needed it sometimes. So. Right. We loved it, but um, I don't know. Of... She has like such an amazing uh, way of never being afraid of making fun of herself, mm. like ever. Mm. And like because of that, she's like able to operate from such a place of joy. And mm. like I feel like that's something that she taught me. Is like, yeah, I'm, I'm dumb. <laughs> yeah, I'm a dummy. <laughs> like, yeah, not like perfect she's... by any means. Right. and it's hilarious, and it's great, and I'm <laughs> right. human, and let's go. You know, right? And no yeah. wonder there's a chosen family because that's the attitude you need with your chosen family. It's like, yeah, here I am. Here I am. <laughs> Judge me if you want, but like, <laughs> I'm with all of my imperfections. Yeah, and they're all quirky and funny, and yeah, yeah. Some of them are really cool. Some of them suck, but <laughs> they all make up me, and I'm right. And I'm like who I am. And, yeah, yeah, and that is a super. That seems like a really essential ingredient in being a great actor. Is that ability of like, mm. here I am, flaws and all. Yeah. It actually is similar to the fist in the pocket idea. Like, yeah. Here's my authentic mm. self, and I'm going to use it when I need it. Mm-hmm. Or have it there as like a reminder almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, my God. Snaps. 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 <laughs> what, um, what is next? What is next for me? For you. Uh, that's a great question. What are you question. in the middle of? I feel like you have so many plates spinning all the time. Yeah. <laughs> You're a comic <laughs> book writer. <laughs> yeah. About that? Yeah. Um, it's incredible. Yeah, we're still working on that. Mm -hmm. I haven't been working on it nearly as much recently Mm -hmm. because I've been really busy. Yeah. Uh, But I still support even (laughs) from afar, even Mm -hmm. when I can't necessarily commit the time. Mm -hmm. But Niobe, She's Life is the name of the comic book. And it's about a half warrior elf um, princess, half human Uh girl uh, whose destiny it is to unite the human world and the elf world. Um, in a in a place called a Sunda, mm-hmm. which is this mythical, magical world. That's I'm, I'm using that word too often. Mythical, <laughs> magical uh, realm. Yes, yes. <laughs> this realm, is so up my alley. I love this. Um, yes. That um, was created by this guy named Sebastian Jones, who has a like, built out this realm with all of its characters and creatures and facets and like with such detail it's really astounding um and he actually invited me to be a part of it and asked me if i wanted to write with him i was like hell yes yeah absolutely um so yeah i've been working on that since i was probably 14 or 15 yeah which Um, is amazing it feels like it sounds like a lot of uh, this is multiple instances of people coming to you and being like i need the teenage perspective i need the teenage yes. black girl perspective right. yeah and, like, and i'm like you're ready wow, to go like, mad respect that <laughs> right you want an authentic perspective because yeah. not everyone does <laughs> sure oh yeah <laughs> yeah totally um and then what else do i have going on right now i've been working on a lot of music recently actually mm-hmm. uh which has been super nice because there's no like weight on that form of artistry for me yet indeed uh yes. which is why i'm not super keen to sign to a label at this point oh, okay. um mm. or necessarily anytime soon but you know you never cool. know cool. um because i'm like 
all about this like I'm all about this life of being able to create something with complete freedom totally. and your own structure have fun my own structure yeah. have no due dates mm -hmm. or like confines or expectation mm. um so that's been really that's great because yeah. i've been working my musicianship and mm -hmm. working on my violin skills mm -hmm. a bit because um i grew up classically trained but like in recent years, uh -huh. I've kind of like I know how that goes. Adapted my own form oh, of cool. playing, but I'm like it's cool. But I'm I'm just want to like kind of get back to some of the basics also. Sure. Um, and I love that on this podcast we love this stuff about like it's good to have another creative outlet, especially as yes. an actor, when you aren't usually driving your own path as an actor. You're yeah. a little bit more beholden to the whims of other people. Yes. That <laughs> sounds like that's good advice. Very is to, true. <laughs> wherever you can, like find your own power and your own yeah, creativity absolutely well that's like definitely what i'm all about right now um because although i am an actor and i love it so much i like have never i'm not really about the whole like you're one thing and that's what you're supposed to be sure only totally. like <laughs> mentality you know totally um <laughs> i always want to be doing several things at once and like exploring different parts of myself my creativity you know totally um, so yeah, and I've been collaborating on some cool media pieces that I can't really talk about, but oh, it'll okay. be cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> that was vague. Sorry, I'll move <laughs> on. Um, no, it's great. I am writing a script right now. Oh, amazing. Um, because... I really want to direct and something that I've always wanted to do <sighs> really badly. Um, <sighs> and I also, yeah, like you're saying, don't want to always be beholden to mm -hmm. the greater forces. Totally. Screw um, them. <laughs> be your own great force. Um, definitely looking for good stuff. But, you know, it's, it's hard to find material after this one. <laughs> oh, I bet. Oh, yeah. Because this one was just, like, <laughs> so in alignment and, like, married all of my, like, personal beliefs, yeah. like, political views and, like, with, like, what kind of material I was looking for sure. and what kind of character I wanted to explore. And it was just, like, was really lovely <laughs> I mean, yeah. perfect. So um, I'm kind of, like, giving myself time to figure out what feels like the next step, but I don't. I yeah. feel like I'm in a rush at all. Good. Yeah, because yeah, I agree, like, I looking back at your career 10 or 20 years from now, it could it could really be, like, certainly as of right now, Star Carter is, as an actor, what you, that's who you, that's what you're known for. Like, that's as it should mm. be, I think, because mm. it is that. And I'm down. Exactly. Like, I'm trying totally to get a star be... tattoo. <gasps> <Really>? <laughs> I haven't decided. A star star. I don't think, I think that's kind of corny. Like, I don't want to be that <laughs> hoe with, like, a star tattoo. <laughs> But sure. <laughs> like a star oh on like my butt. But like <laughs> right? I um I really have thought about it a lot and I'm like mm. if there is anything that I really feel like I will carry with me for mm -hmm. the rest of my life and totally. I never will want to forget it was the experience of being a part of this film. That's amazing. So like I've thought about like different ways of getting a thug tattoo. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, and I don't mean like a thug tattoo. I mean yeah. uh, the hate you give the acronym. tattoo yeah. <laughs> acronym. Yes. To make that very clear before like I get canceled. Like a fist in your pocket. Like a tattoo is like a fist in your pocket. Ooh. Like you can keep it with you and That's somewhat a secret. Good one. Yeah. That's a good one. I was also yeah. It's a part Angie, of who you Angie are told and... me that she wants to get a rose in concrete. Ooh yeah. For Ooh. star. I cool. Think that's really cool. I thought about getting an R. Uh huh. Um, because, you know, at the beginning of the film, she says two R's. Two R's. Don't ask me what the extra R is for. Oh, yeah, I like that. That's so cool. I don't know. Yeah. have some ideas floating around. Oh, amazing. <laughs> um, this has been so great. I have to wrap, we have to wrap up. Can I ask you, like, um, we ask a lot about acting advice. And I think beca particularly because you got started so young, yeah. is there um, advice that you give to early career actors or like, multi-hyphenate artists um either they're aspiring young stars or they are young stars mm. and they get a hunger games like big break like what, are, what is your advice for that phase get used to rejection <laughs> okay that's our favorite piece no. of advice <laughs> yeah no it's it's true i mean yeah yeah i think when i was that age i had like some kind of expectation and you know i think it's different for everyone mm-hmm 
I mean, I guess, like, I can really only speak to my experience as, like, a, a black actress. Sure. Um, yeah. The way that I see things is I'm I'm really comfortable with rejection within the industry, probably because I've been auditioning since I was really tiny. Okay. Um, so it's kind of normalized for you. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty normalized. And if I don't get something, I'm like, oh, all right. Cool. You know? Yeah. Unless I really, really, really care about it. Yeah. Um, but it, but because um, uh, I I generally believe you you do not end up um in things that you are not supposed to be a part of. Right. You know, and mm. so mm-hmm. if you don't get a job, like well, that wasn't the right one. Yeah. You know. Sure. And. Sometimes I've been able to see kind of on the other side, on the casting side. Mm -hmm. And that's really, that really is what's going on is it doesn't come down to a lot of the time, is this person much better than the other person? But is this person right? You know, like. And that can mean a lot of different things. And that can mean so many different things. And so I think letting go of the idea of I was either good enough or I wasn't. Yeah. Um, Not can so much be healthy. Talent. Yeah. Yeah, because sometimes that can be like kind of like debilitating to think that way. Like, yeah. oh, like I was either, I must have been not good enough. Like, I must have been not good enough. Yeah. It's like such a dangerous headspace to get into, yeah. you know? So it's so like, like, am I enough? I'm not enough. Yeah, exactly. There, yeah, and that's, 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 that's a subsequent acting. thought. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so, like, I feel like if you just keep in mind that. Oftentimes that's not what it is. It's just if if you're right for something, you're right for something. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I was kind of like I kind of grew up with like a sense of just faith that things work out how they're supposed to, like instilled mm-hmm. in me by my mom. So cool. I like fall back on that in Good. in times of distress. Um, what else would I say? Make your own stuff. Mm-hmm. Always stay creative. Excellent. So we got kind of already covered that. I mean, it's great advice. <laughs> we got to go. And we got to <laughs> wrap it up. Um, sometimes it's, oh, this is my last piece of advice. Yeah. Sometimes it's a really good idea to just shut up and listen. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, watch and observe and read and mm. uh, build up your well of knowledge Mm. and resources amazing cool lovely (laughs) wonderful Amanda thank you thank you that was so that was so great that was so awesome In the Envelope, an awards podcast, is recorded at Lotus Productions, Hyperbolic Audio, and Big Yellow Duck in New York City, and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Like, rate, subscribe, tell your friends, and follow us on Twitter at In the Envelope. Thanks, as always, to producer, editor, and all-around podcast extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and thank you to the team at Backstage the most trusted name in casting. That's Peter Rappaport, Rowan al Francis Ramos, Caitlin Watkins, Lauren Rout, Mark Stinson, and especially Casey Howe. For more awards and industry coverage, head over to Backstage.com. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time for another glimpse in the envelope. On the next episode of In the Envelope, we are joined by Natalie Portman, the thing of asking yourself what you really want and, and differentiating that from what other people want is like, yeah. it's hard to do at age 11. It is hard, but there's also kind of a purity in what you want because mm. I think that there's, you know, when you're really obsessed with something when you're that age, there's just mm. like a pure love for what you're doing. Cool. And um, my husband and I talk about it a lot because he was that into dance. At that age, mm-hmm. that was the age that I realized I was obsessed with acting and wanting to do it and wanting to focus on it and it was all I thought about was about the same age that he wanted to just dance all the time and 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 I think it's Walter Murch who said like if you're an adult and wondering where your passion lies think about what you loved when you were 11 years old Mm. I think it was him who um, identified that age as specific so I think it's very lucky to have that kind of 
passion that early because mm -hmm. there are certain things that it takes a lot of practice to, yeah. you know, you need years and years and years of trying stuff and messing up and working mm -hmm. harder and mm -hmm. um, to, to get to a point where you can feel more at ease with what you do.